Wireshark offers us several different ways to save packets. If we're doing a live collection, capturing traffic right off of the network, and then we stop, we can just simply select File, Save, and then we can save all the packets if we want to at that time. We also have the option of saying that we will only want to save the selected packets, so I have one selected packet in the background. Or we can say that we want to save a range of packets. So I could say I want to do I want to save packets one through three hundred, let's say. We just give it a name and this is an HTTP download one dot pcap. We can say save. Now if we clear that out, I don't want to save anything else. I'll go ahead and I'll open up the HTTP. Download one, there it is. And we can see there are only 300 packets in that trace. Now, in addition, if we open up a trace file, I've just opened up the client dying trace file. We can save packets based on whether they're marked or not. We can save packets from the from one marked packet to another marked packet, or we can save packets based on a filter, what we've filtered on. Now, this trace has a couple of strange little uh, communication sequences. We have a TFTP communication in there, and we also have an IRC communication. So I've created a filter looking for TFTP traffic or IRC traffic, and I'll hit enter. And now I have both of those communications in the display. So I can see down below that out of 514 packets, 281 packets match my filter. I want to save those filtered packets, so I'll select File, Save As. Now I have to be careful here that I don't just give it a name and think that I'm done. I want to make sure that I click on the button in front of Displayed. Now I'm going to save all 281 packets. I'll save this trace by the name of T, uh, tftp ircpcap There we go. Now I'm going to clear out that filter. Now, as I'm looking through trace files, when I see something interesting, I'll right mouse click and mark the packet. So there's a DCERPC, which seems a little strange to me, in the trace. I'll scroll through a little bit more. Oh, there's another DCERPC. I'll mark this one and I'll mark this one. Well, there's a couple other DCERPCs, but those are just retransmissions. And now we see the beginning of our TFTP communications. That seems weird to me. Now, I really like marking them this way because when I have to get back to them quickly, I can just simply search for the next marked packet. I'll right mouse click and mark the beginning of the IRC communication as well. And let's see, I think I'll send here. Yeah, here we have an HTTP GET request. So those are my marked packets, and they all show up with a black background and that white foreground. If I want to just save out those marked packets, I'll select File, Save As. And then on the left-hand side here, I'll select Marked Packets. I'll give it a name, unusualpackets.pcap, and save. Now I can unmark all packets and select the beginning and the ending of a sequence. Mark the beginning, mark the end of the sequence, and have it just save the packets from the beginning to the end based on the marker. So I'm going to select Let's say this packet number 216, I'll mark it. And then I'll scroll through, go up to packet 265, and I'll mark that one. Now if I wish, I can say that I want to save from the first to the last marked packet. Now the interesting thing here is that I still have the option of whether I'm focusing on the captured packets or the displayed packets. Now, this is where this would come into play when you're working with the marked packets. I'm going to cancel out of that, and I'll go up, and I'm going to clear all of the packets. Well, let's say I mark this DCERPC as an interesting packet, and there's a SYN packet. Oops, there's a SYN packet here coming in that I think is interesting, so I'll mark that one. I'll mark uh, this one right here, and maybe this TFTP packet. Now, if I put on a TFTP filter, not all of my marked packets are visible to me anymore. I've only got this one marked packet visible to me. 
So now when I select File, Save As, you can see we have a difference in number in the marked packets between the captured marked packets and the displayed marked packets. If I only wanted to save the ones that were currently visible to me with the display filter, then I have to make sure that I click on the display button. But if I want to save the packets, even though they're not visible to me, I can still do that. I can say I want to save all the packets from the first to the last marked packets. And I'll save it as marked packets. Pcap. Now that's saved the trace with a separate name, and I've got it from the first to the last marked packet, even though they're not visible to me at that time. Here's a little trick. If you're going to save all of the TFTP traffic and you want to analyze it using another protocol analyzer, you can say File, Save As, and here are all the types that, Wire, that Wireshark recognizes. So if I wanted to, oh look, I can even go back to the old Novell Analyzer product. Wow. But I can save it in Sun Snoop format. I can save it in uh, a format that Netmon will accept. I can save it in a Sniffer, the 1.1 version of Sniffer format or Network Instruments Observer product format. You can save in all these different formats. And then you can go and you can pick up the trace file in that other analyzer and do additional analysis on your communications. We have some limitations on how we can save the information with conversations and endpoints at the current time. And maybe this will change with future versions of Wireshark. But right now I've got a trace file up and I'll select Statistics, Conversations. And what you'll see missing is an Export button or a Print button. We don't have any options other than a Copy button. And when I click on the Copy button, it will copy what you see up here in the Conversations window to the clipboard. I'm going to go over and select TCP, and now I'm, I'm going to make it easy on myself because I'm going to sort it first before I, I export this. The, the chart that I want to build out of this is going to be based on the bytes out for each of the address A uh, column IP addresses there. So while it's sorted, I'll go ahead and click the copy button. And now, first of all, I'm going to copy it out into WordPad so you can see the format that it copies in. In WordPad, I'll click Control-V to paste it in. And you can see the very first line is going to be my uh, header line. And it's all comma-separated format. Everything is in comma-separated format. And I've got all of the columns in there. I can't select just certain columns to export. I've got to export the whole entire thing. I'll save this document. And I'm going to save it as a text file and I'm going to call it uh, TCP con out, let's say. I'll click Save. It tells me, of course, I'm going to a text-only format and I'll lose any formatting, but I don't have any formatting in there anyway. So I'll say yes. Now I'm going to go over into my spreadsheet program and I'll import this information into my spreadsheet program in comma-separated format and I'll show you, I'll just build a quick little graph from this. I'm running Open Office uh, Calc, and I'll select File, Open. There's my TCP con out, and when I bring it in, I've got to say that the file type is comma separated. So I'll scroll down, and there's text CSV, comma separated value, and I'll open it up. Now, in the separator options, I've got to make sure that I say, yes, this is comma separated, not tab separated. And you can see that row number one, there's my heading row, and there are all the IP addresses and each one of the columns that I had in that WordPad file. So I'll say OK. Now it brings it into OpenOffice. I just went through and quickly resized that. Now, in this case, I'm interested in charting out, let's see, column A, and I want that bytes out from address A, so I'm going to select column H. I'm using the control key to select A and H. Now I'll scroll down to where I want to place my chart. I want to put my chart right down here. I have a little free space. I'll click the chart button, and this will be where my chart will go. There we go. 
Now, I don't want to go from row from A1 all the way to A30. I, I only want to chart the top 10 talkers in that group. And in H, I only want to go to row H10 as well. My first column is a label. Uh, sorry, my first row is a label, and my first column is the label as well. I'll click Next. Now, I think it'll be cleaner if I set my data series up in rows instead of in columns. These are the two options here when I put it in columns or rows. And I'll click Next. And this looks good. I'll give it a title. Some bytes out. TCP. And I'll click Create. And there you can see it's just created a little chart for me. We can see that my x-axis is bytes A to B. I'm not even charting B. And these are my values for A. So there's the legend for each one of these folks communicating. And we can see that because I sorted ahead of time, it's already sorted in here, which is really nice. It's sort of a cheating way to go, but it, it works great. You can do the same kind of functions by going into statistics and endpoints as well. And that really makes sense because maybe I want to know who the top talkers are on the network. I would go, you know, on my Ethernet network and sort according to the transmit bytes. Or maybe I would select based on the IP address, the number of bytes out. Or maybe I would like to see how many bytes received or go over UDP or whatever. And all you have to do is just click that copy button and then pop over into the spreadsheet format that you use and build your charts and graphs from that. Flow graphs are some of the more interesting charts and graphs that Wireshark has. But unfortunately, at this time, we can only save those out in ASCII text format. I'll show you how that's done and what it looks like. First, I'll select File, and I'm going to open up a trace file of an FTP communication. So here's our FTP client making the handshake. There's the response coming back, etc. Under Statistics, I will select Flow Graph. And I have no filter applied, so I can just select All Packets. And I think the general flow gives me a lot more information than the TCP flow does. It doesn't matter I'm not doing name resolution, so the last part won't matter to me. I'll say OK. And there's my lovely flow graph. And because I selected the general information, not just TCP information, um, I've got all of this detail here showing the request for user Fred, and then the response, the password, everything like that. So at this point, I can select Save As. And the default, as I said before, is it's going to save this as an ASCII text file. Now, I have a directory right off of the root of C and the directory is called tests. And I'm going to save it in my tests directory. I'll call this file, hmm, I'll call it FTP test onetxt I'm going to just save it as a standard text file, so I went ahead and put the extension on it anyway. I'll say OK. Now I'm going to go over to WordPad and open it up in WordPad. In WordPad, I'll select open, point to my FTP test one file, double click, and there it is. And this is really common, unfortunately. Um, they get a lot of line wraps on this. So I'm going to select Control A, change the format of the font down to an eight point font. And hopefully I won't have the line wrapping issue. If I do, I can change it down to a smaller font. But there we go. It looks just like the chart. We've got the time column, we've got the two devices communicating. You'll see, though, that we've got a cutoff right there where we lost some information. FTP, SYN, sequence, ACK, little things are missing like that. But we have all the detail on the right-hand side, which I really like. This is great when you go to print it out to show someone, hey, this is what happened in the communication. In Section 8, I did talk already about working with TCP data streams as a method of filtering. In this section, I'm going to talk about the different variations for saving those TCP data streams out. And I'll give you another example of reassembling data after it's been captured and collected as a TCP data stream. 
The trace file I'm going to open is called ftp-download-group3. And in this trace file, we have three different FTP downloads taking place. We don't have any of the FTP control channel information. We actually just have the download channel information. So we're not looking at packets to and from port 21. We're looking at the actual file transfers taking place. The first thing I'll do is go up to statistics and conversations. And we can see that we have five different TCP streams in here. If we want to prioritize which streams we pull out first, we can sort according to maybe the bytes column, find the streams that have the most bytes transferred across. In this example, I'm going to start with this very first TCP communication. And I'll use the conversations window to simply filter that out first before I build the TCP stream. So I'll click a right mouse arrow, apply as a filter based on the selected value bidirectionally between address A and address B. And that just simply applied my filter in the background. So now I can just right mouse click and say follow the stream and I'm only going to be looking at that one communication. Now because I don't have any information about the file name yet, I didn't have any of the control information uh, in front of this download sequence. I may not be able to tell what type of a file it is, so if I save it out, I might not know what it is. But I can tell that JFIF, that means it's a JPEG file. So I know that when I save this out, I'm going to save it out in with a JPEG extension. Now, depending on what you're looking at, the different formats that you're looking at, if you were, let's say, for instance, looking at the hex dump format, in that case, if you said save as, you would be saving it as a hex dump. So I'll save a file called hex dump. And I'll go over to that directory. There's the hex dump file. I'll right mouse click, open that file, and I'm going to open it with, let's open it with WordPad. And there we go. You can see that we have the byte offset on the left hand side, then we have the bytes themselves, and then we have the ASCII uh, version on the right hand side. So you have to make sure that when you are going to save these files that you have selected the proper format before you perform the save as operation. If I wanted to take this one particular TCP stream and I wanted to reassemble it, I need to select raw so that it's not saved with any sort of formatting information or any additional information. In addition, if you were following the stream and you saw some red communications coming from a client and some blue communications coming from the server, and you only wanted to reassemble the data that was coming from the server, you could click on this down arrow and say that you wanted to gather the traffic going in one direction or the other direction. And it will tell you how many bytes were transferred in each direction. So you can tell which one of the systems is sending the data and which one of the systems is receiving the data. In this case, this whole entire TCP stream contains data being transferred from server down to a client. So I've selected raw, and I'll select save as. Now I know that it ends in a JPEG extension, but I don't know the name of the file, so I'm just going to call it file1.jpg, and I'll save it to that directory. Now I'll go over there and test it and see if it does reassemble it so I can open it up again. Here I am in this directory, and the only reason it's given it the icon in front is just because of the extension. It could be completely wrong, but it would still give it that icon. I'll double click on the file, and sure enough, there is the JPEG image completely reassembled. Sometimes we can tell what the extension should be and what type of file it is based on the contents of the file itself. Let's go take a look at one of those. I'm going to close out this TCP stream, and I'll clear my filter that I have. I'll go back into the conversations area, and again, I'm going to look at the TCP streams, and I'll sort them. And I'm going to look at this, let's see, the, the third, I'll take the third one down, the third most active communication based on the byte count. I'll right mouse click, apply it as a filter based on the selected value going to A or B bidirectionally. Now I've just pulled out that particular communication. Remember that if you're in the middle of a trace file and you have a lot of different conversations going on, you don't have to use the conversations window to pull one of those out. You can just 
you know, right mouse click on any one of the packets in the TCP stream and it'll pull that one out. So now I'm going to say I want to follow that stream. And here, now I don't have anything readable in the upper left hand corner, the beginning of the file that tells me what the file is. But if I scroll down, I can tell that it's, it's a, some sort of a document that has instructions. And I'm looking for anything that indicates what type of a file it might be, and there we go. We can see it says Microsoft Word document, Microsoft Word, and MS Word doc right there. So now I know that when I save this one, I'll select raw, save as, I'm going to save it as file2.doc. Now let me show you that if, if you work with one of these files and it doesn't have anything in the upper left hand corner like the JPEG did, it had the JFIF, and it doesn't have anything inside of it that indicates what type of a, an application was used to create the file, you might still be able to look at the hex dump area and look for some sort of a file signature in there. I can tell you that the value D0CF11E0A1B11A1E1 is a file signature for Word documents. So even if it didn't have that information embedded in the file, it would still be able to tell that it's a Word document. I'm going to close this window, clear out my filter, and then now I'll go to one more conversation. Uh, this time I will pull out the fourth conversation down the line. I'll right mouse click apply it as a filter, now, I don't have to apply this filter. I could always say just find a packet that's somewhere in that stream. So there, just put in the value to find a packet based on a display filter. There's what I'm looking for. I'll say find. Okay, I have to start from the beginning of the packet capture. Close that down. And it got it already. So what it'll do is it'll automatically wrap to the beginning of the trace file. And so I, here's that conversation. I'll right mouse click and follow the TCP stream. And you can tell by the beginning what type of a file this is. Now I know that when I save this file, I'm going to save it with an extension of GIF. I'm going to make sure that I click raw. And that's a, a common mistake that people will leave it at ASCII, thinking there's no difference between raw and ASCII. But there actually is. Some additional characters will put in when you're in ASCII mode. And uh, it may not open. I'll save this as file3.gif. And now let me go and test that file. There's my directory. I'm going to double click it, and there we go. Now, besides doing reassembly, we can also look at bidirectional communications and see the color coding there. Anytime you spend too much time in the bottom right-hand corner in the hex window portion, that's when you really want to start following the TCP stream. Uh, let me bring up another trace file. I'll clear out my filter, first of all. I'm going to open up another trace file, which is called Client Dying. Now, here we go. We've got this big, long trace, lots of communications in here. There's a TFTP communication. I'll scroll down to find a T TCP communication, and we'll just look at this. Here I've highlighted a TFTP packet, and that'd be great if that one could be reassembled so I could just read what was going on in there. I'll right mouse click, but follow TCP stream doesn't show up as an option. If you don't see it as an option, then that packet doesn't have a TCP header. And sure enough, TFTP uses UDP. So we can't reassemble that using uh, the TCP stream option. Let me just go a little further in here, and there's an HTTP communication. There's an IRC communication, and the IRC communication that's in here is uh, sitting on top of TCP. So I'll right mouse click and follow the stream. Now we can see that nice color coding. So here we can see the client sent in a password, a nickname, a user name, and then all this blue information came down from the IRC server. Then the client went back and sent some more information up to the server, and the server came back and answered that. So we see it going back and forth and back and forth with the color coding. Remember that you can change that color coding if you don't like the red and the blue. You can go into Edit Preferences, select Colors, and here are the colors that you're using 
by default for a marked packet, a TCP stream client, and a TCP stream server. So you can change them if you wish to. Once you change them, don't forget to click apply. And then your streams will show up in a different color when you view them. Wireshark offers several different ways to export packet information. First, I'll open up a trace file called http-espn.pcap. Now, I might want to export all of the summary information, the information that's in the top window, or maybe I want to export all of the detailed decode information, or maybe I even want to export the hex dump down here. I have a choice when I export whether I want to export just a selected packet or if I want to export maybe just marked packets, or I want to export packets from the first marked packet to the last marked packet. I even have the option of just exporting filtered packets as well. So if I wanted to, I could just export the DNS traffic. Let me show you what this looks like when we export packets and what our options are. I'll select File, Export, and at this point I don't have the option of exporting a selected set of packet bytes because I don't have any specific packet bytes selected in the hex window. So I'll select file and I'll give it a name. This is going to be my, first of all, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll export the DNS traffic. Now because I'm exporting the DNS traffic, that's what I was filtering on in the background, I'll click on displayed and it tells me there are 36 packets in there that match my display filter. And the format that I export into the default will be plain text, but I also have the option of, de of uh, exporting in PostScript format, CSV format, uh, XML packet summary format, or XML packet de uh, detail format. In addition, on the right-hand side, I have the, the choice of whether I want to include the packet details, the packet bytes, do I want each packet on a new page, which of course, that could be really, really long. So I'm just going to export the packet summary line and I've got it set for displayed, all packets, the name is DNS, and I'll click Save. Now let's go look at what that file looks like. Here's the directory and there's the file called DNS. I'll double click on that file and I'm going to choose to open that file with WordPad. And there we go. Now you can see that the lines are wrapping just because of course, I've got my window reduced in size for this recording, so I'll bring the window as far out as I possibly can. And you can see how long some of those lines are. So this is one of those things that you, know, you might want to print it in landscape format, change the font size, however it'll fit on your page. But that's, that's how easy it is. I'll close this window down, and now I'll go back over to Wireshark. And in Wireshark, we have another option, which is where we can click somewhere down in this hex window and as you can see, I just clicked on a field, and I don't know if you've noticed it, but if you look in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see that the field name is actually uh, being presented to you, as well as the length. So there we can see that we're in the query name field, the dns.query.name, which as soon as you start learning those things, you can use those kind of names in your display filters area. I'll click up further in the packet. You can see I'm in the IP time to live field now. Uh, now I'm in the IP source field. But let's say I had an interesting name and I wanted to save that. I could right mouse click and I could either copy all that information, that's copying it to the clipboard, or I could copy the text only, or I could export the selected packet bytes. Now when you export the selected packet bytes doing it this way, you have the format of raw data available to you, or you can select all files and give it another extension on there as opposed to .bin, .dat, or .raw. I'll cancel out on that one. You'll see when we go into the next section, which is the print section, how you can take a single packet, right mouse click, and print that one packet and what your options are for printing as opposed to exporting packets.
In this module, I'm going to show you how to print in Wireshark. And I've simply opened a trace file. This one is the http-espn.pcap trace file. And I'll select File, Print, and the print window comes up. Now you have a choice in here to print in either plain text or in postscript format. And typically most people will print in plain text. If you print in postscript format, there's a note inside of that postscript file that tells you how to do conversions between PS format and PDF format using a tool called GhostScript. I'm going to print in plain text format and I have a choice of what packets I want to print just like we have with saving and exporting. I could choose to save all packets or print all packets or print only selected packets. Again, I have the option of just selecting displayed packets as well. I could print the marked packets only or from the first to the last marked packet or I could specify a range and I will specify a range from 1 to 100. In addition, you have the choice of whether you want to print just the summary line, that's that top area there, or the packet details. And if you print the packet details, do you want them collapsed or as they're displayed in the background or all expanded? So that means clicking on these little plus uh, symbols in your detailed decode that expands them. And then, you know, when they're a, a negative, a minus, you can you know, collapse them at that point. So however you want to lay it out, it will remember that and use that if you select as displayed. And then you can also choose to print the packet bytes. That's the hex dump down at the bottom. In addition, just like we have with exporting, you have the option of saying that you want each packet to be on a new page. So I'm just going to print the packet summary line. I've directed it to the C colon backslash tests directory. If that's not the directory I want, I can browse and choose another directory. But that is the directory I will use here. And I'll give it a file name of test print dot, and I'm going to call it dot txt because I'm going to use a text format. I'll click print. Now let's toggle over and take a look at that file. Here it is, and I will open this file, and there is our text file. Again, I was just getting the summary line, and on your system, of course, you probably would want to print in landscape mode on something like this, or reduce the font size. Now, just a moment ago, I printed out in a postscript format, and I wanted to show you what it looks like. So I'll say that I want to open this file. There we go. And at the beginning it says PS Adobe 2.0 and there's a note in here about GhostScript which is the tool that you can use to convert these PostScript files over into PDF format. GhostScript is available online at SourceForge as well so you can download it from there. I'll close this window out and let's go back over to Wireshark. Another option we have inside of Wireshark is just to select a packet off of the summary window right mouse click and say that we want to print. It'll bring us up to the print window and it will already have selected this second setting, selected packet only. So that's all it's going to print because, I mean, obviously you were looking at the packet a moment ago. You right mouse clicked on it so that's, it makes the assumption that that's what you're going to want to print. So printing is pretty simple. The only two printing formats available to you are plain text and postscript. The time when printing gets frustrating is when you open up some sort of a statistic Maybe you look at the summary and you find that you're missing a print button. And hopefully that will change in future versions of Wireshark. In many cases when you're using Wireshark, you're going to want to create a network report that shows someone else what you found when you were looking on the network. Now in this, this instance, I have a trace file open called Download Bad to Good. And what I'd like to do is I'll, I'll show you some of the graphics that I would include in a report. The first thing I want to do in this particular situation is look at the conversations because I have two downloads in here. One is a fast download and one is a slow download. And I want to make a really nice graph and do a screenshot of that graph that I'll, I'll use in my report. So under IP, I'm going to sort according to the bytes. I'm going to look at the first conversation and I know already from looking at this trace file that this is the good download. I'll apply that value as a filter 
Now I only did that as a fast way to get the filter up here in this window. I'll click three times in that area and hit Control C to copy that into the buffer. Now I'm going to create my IO graph and this is what I'll be building a screenshot on. Now I know this is the good download so I'm going to use the color green to graph this out. I'll paste in that filter, click on graph 3, and the reason we don't see it is because it is covering up this area over here. The black line is covering it up. So I'm going to change that to an F bar. So there's our good download. Now I like keeping the um, black line in there if I'm going to use this F bar format. I'm going to toggle back over to Wireshark now, clear this out, and now I'm going to put in the filter for the bad download. I'm just back over in my conversations area. I know that that's the bad download. I'll right mouse click and apply this as the filter. And again, I'm only doing this so that I can just click three times to get that filter and I don't have to manually type it in because I'm way too lazy to do that. So I'll do control C and now I'll bring up my IO graph that I'm working on. Now I know this is the bad download so I'm going to paste that in and click on graph 2 and now it'll be a really nice black line across the top showing me everything and I need to change the red to an F bar style format. There we go. So we can see that we have the bad download and then something else happened and then the good download and that makes a really nice graphic. Let me show you the tool that I use to do all of my screenshots. It's Snagit by TechSmith Corporation and this is by far my very favorite screenshot utility that's out there. In the input area when I'm working with these screens I have the choice of just selecting the active window which is what I want. I just want the active window in the background here. Then I also have this great option to select shapes so I can circle something and create a, a freehand shape and capture that or an ellipse or a rounded rectangle triangle or a polygon. In addition I have the capability of doing scrolling and copying things out to the clipboard. I've got auto scroll on and I don't actually need that right now so I'm going to turn that off. It's also very easy to capture the menu. So I'll show you that in just a moment. First, let me capture this screenshot in the background and show you some of the things that we can do with that screenshot. So I'm highlighting this right now and I've got this set up, instead of doing a print screen, I've got this set up to use Control P to grab the screenshot. Now it will automatically bring up the capture preview window. I have it set that way and you can get rid of that if you don't like it. But the nice thing about this is that I can change or add things to the, the graphic, add a label or add a call out. Maybe I want to have a call out uh, points to, let's see, one area. Oops, I want to go this direction. And good download. I'll say OK. And I'll resize that call out now. So I want to make sure both my words fit inside of there. bring this up, change the pointer, there we go. Now that is a lot nicer than having to, you know, manually go in and bring it into another program. And I've just copied and pasted that and I'm going to go in and edit this where it says bad download. Say OK. And now I can change the pointer so it points towards the bad download. And maybe I even want to change the property color so that this is red and the other is green. There are so many things that you can do with this tool. I'll show you what it looks like when you bring in another graph and you start working with the spotlight and magnify effects as well. That can be really, really nice what you come out, out with for your uh, report. First I'll save this image as uh, bad-good. And by default, I'm going to save it in PNG format, which is nice because then I can put it over another background at some point. It'll just match right up to the edge. I won't have you know, a, a, a white square behind it. So I'll save that. Close this down. I'm done with this. There's that directory. OK. Now, I like this. I'm not going to get rid of this. So I'll just pop back over to Wireshark. And let's say 
let's say I see something of interest in a trace file. Maybe as I scroll through here, I see a lot of you know, window update packets or something. If I think this is an interesting screen and I want to really highlight this window update, I'll hit Control P. And now I want to focus on that window update area. I don't need the paint tools, so I'll get rid of that. I'll right mouse click to bring us over further on this side. Now I'm going to select Spotlight and Magnify. So I'm going to select the area that I want to magnify, and really I want the reader to be focused in on this area of the packet. Now I'll click Continue, Spotlight, and Magnify and I'll magnify out that area of the trace. That might be a little bit much. That's good. And I'll dim the background so they won't be focused on the trace information in the background. I'll even blur the background a little bit to make sure that they don't focus on that too much at all. If I wish, I can do a drop shadow on that, which makes it look really nice. And I can move it to the side. So I'll change its horizontal position. There we go. And we end up with a really nice looking graphic. And it's obvious when somebody sees that graphic in your report what you're trying to point them towards. I'll save this file. I'll call this uh, Magnify 1. And I'll show you one last thing that you can do when you're working with the full screen uh, screenshot like that. There's the option of doing perspective and shear. And I'm going to select. Uh, well, maybe I'll keep the selection. No, I'll select the entire image and continue. And what I'm going to do is change the perspective of this graphic image so I can turn it to its side. Let me scroll over so you can see what I've done to it. Fantastic. You build a report and you put something like that on the front of it and it's really going to get someone's attention. I'll save this file as magnify two and I'm finished with that file and I'll cancel out. Now I also want to show you how you can date and timestamp your graphics as well. So here's the image that I want to include in my report. Actually let me let me pick something new. Let's open up a different trace file. We'll open up client dying. It's an interesting trace. There's a, a lot of IRC traffic in there a lot of color, and I'll hit Control P to save that whole screen. Now I've changed my mind. I don't want to save the whole screen. I only want to save a portion of it. So I'll finish with this file and I'm not going to save it at all. I'm going to cancel out of this. In this case I'm going to toggle back over to snag it. And for the input this time I'm going to say that I want to capture a region. Now I'll pop back over to Wireshark, hit Control P, and I'm interested just in this area. Now that's all I have here. I want to apply a caption to this graphic, so I'll click Caption, and there's my date and time stamp. I can just pop it right up on top. By default it's going to place that caption outside of the image. If I wish I can put it inside of the image. There it is down on the bottom. And you have some options for caption setting, such as what text color do you want for your font. Maybe I want it to be in, oh, in red. There we go. And then the background color, I want it to really stand out, so I'll put it in a light yellow. It's great. It, it, they did such a good job with this tool. It, it looks so nice. They did a lovely job, and it makes life so much easier when you're trying to build a network analysis report. I'm going to finish with this file. I'll save it. I will call it um, Caption 1. Now I mentioned captioning before, but let me show you how you can automatically put captions on all of your pictures. I'll select Filters and Caption and say that I want it to prompt me for a caption. So there will be the graphic up there and this will be where the sample text will go, whatever I put as the caption. And I also want it to be date and time stamped. Say OK. Now in a moment I'll do a capture for you and you'll see that I'm prompted for the caption. 
But this time I'm going to pick a different input type. I'm going to select input, shapes, and I'll do e ellipse, let's say. This is nice. Over in Wireshark, I'll hit Control P. Now, this is the area that I want to build a screenshot from. And there it is. It's asking me what caption I would like. Strange IRC stuff. I'll say OK. And there is my screenshot. There's my caption down below. And there's my date and timestamp up above. I'm going to save this file as ellipse. and finish that off. That's a lot of there. This is great. I can't say enough about Snagit and the other tool that I use from TechSmith, which is uh, Camtasia. Fantastic tools. And remember, you should be documenting what your findings are. You should end up that every time you troubleshoot something, make sure you grab some screenshots of it, put it into a simple little document, and turn that over to management, or keep that and hold that as an example of some of the analysis projects that you've been on.